about the turtle? Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so when we when I go foraging, um, I don't always forage just for plants. I always forage for meat as well if I can find it. And I was really really lucky um, to have come across a um, a snapping turtle. Uh, two times ago we went out um, and the most amazing thing about snapping turtles is that they have five different kinds of meat that you can eat so uh, for me it was a real bonus to find this beauty um, they're very difficult they've got a very tough skin um, but they are fantastic once you manage to get that away to um, eat uh, the tail the leg uh, just be above the head um, really really fantastic so I also use the shells uh, for my living history classes as well because native peoples use them um, not only for um, plates and dishes but decoration too so it was a, a double win for me <laughs> what does uh, the meat taste like how would you describe it to someone who's never eaten snapping turtle before i would say it tastes like pork actually quite frankly um, i mean there's some really nice dark meat um, but like i say there's, there's literally five different kinds so as you can see the meat in the tail is different from the meat in the claws i've uh, just pulled this out of the, f the freezer right now so he's frozen but will i would let him defrost and then slowly peel the skin away and cook it in soups stews um, sometimes i get to roast them if they're big enough uh, really fantastic <laughs> What else do we have here? Uh, oh, sure. <laughs> I'm going to move my coffee cup. So basically what I have here on this table is an array of everything that I look for, for when I go out foraging, um, whether it be berries um, in the autumn, which I dry um, and store, um, or if it's mosses and rock tripes, like this is rock tripe, it's absolutely delicious. Um, you, um, there are about five or six different varieties in uh, this area alone. Um, you have the really big ones and then you have small ones um, and I'll show you some of those later on. But they taste like oatmeal. Uh, you can put them into water and they turn a little bit gelatinous and they're absolutely delicious. So um, it's a very historical food which I find absolutely fascinating. Uh, there are accounts in 1776 of George Washington um, out in a particularly hard battle during the winter uh, being shown by the Stockbridge Mohicans. This is a, f a f survival food um, and it did in fact get them through the winter because their other supplies were low. Mm -hmm. wow, yeah, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, other things I have um, that I always look for when I am foraging are things like fireweed. Now fireweed's really cool, not only because you can obviously use the um, seed pods for um, fire lighting, which obviously I love to do with the traditional courses, but um, the roots, the leaves and the stems are all really, really edible and very peppery, which is why it's called fireweed, not just because you can do make fire with this, but because it is quite a hot thing to have. Um, I love reindeer moss. Uh, I use that a lot. Um, it's so plentiful and um, you wash it twice because it has a lot of uh, the acid in it. Uh, in clean water and then you can either eat it like this which I find too rubbery so what I tend to do is I take it down into a flour and um, use it as a thickener in my soups and stews in the winter it's really really yummy and talking about soups and stews uh, this wonderful basket here is full of what we call sunchokes um, a lot of people know them as Jerusalem artichokes and assume that they're just for the gardens because they make amazing yellow flowers. Um, but what people are just beginning to learn now is that the tubers of a sun cho cho choke are actually really delicious. Uh, I here at home turn them into um, fries and I also love to mash them, um, but they are also edible raw too. So if you're in a survival situation, this is a really handy tuber to find and eat without having to make a fire and cook. Really love those. And everything here is like available within the yes. Uh, Adirondack Yes, Park. everything on this table you are going to find, whether it's the maple, um, this is maple syrup, but I also do um, birch syrup too, uh, which the natives would add with the uh, sumac to make drinks. Um, syrup was used a lot back in the day um, before European contact actually as a sweetener because that was their sugar. So you would um, be boiling 
uh, your roots, for example, and um, tubers with syrup and to give a nice sweet flavor and also using it for drinks. It's um, a very, very common sweetener um, which was extensively used. And then, of course, um, very common here in these mountains are mushrooms which is my absolute um, favorite thing in the world to talk about. So whether it's the jelly mushrooms, which are dehydrated like this, and then they hydrate up to 40 times their size within, uh, this is an hour and a half, it's been in the water and it's hydrated up. Um, they're really good, you can eat them raw. To oyster mushrooms, um, to chaga, which I um, use in my coffee, and also for medicinal, to reishi, to lion's mane. Um, and also to puffballs. Uh, we have puffballs here, um, and they are the big white mushrooms that you see on the edges of clearings. And I'm sure that a lot of you, when you were younger, used to throw them at your siblings and have a lot of fun with them. But they're also edible. Um, and so what I like to do is I cut them into slices, and you can batter these and fry them as, as, and eat them like this. Or you can go one step further and you turn it into a flower like this. So these have been used again um, to soups and stews as a thickener um, and also to help make patties with other flowers um, that I make using natural um, plants and trees. Um, I think the most important thing I have on this whole table here to me is this little birch basket here made of birch and this is um, birch cambium. Now the Adirondacks the name the Adirondacks actually means um, bark eater. Tradition goes that um, the opposite tribe, whether it would be Apanapi or, or Mohican, uh, would eat the bark during winter because they were such bad hunters that that was the only thing that they could eat. So Adirondack actually means bark eater. Um, so you can eat the cambium from underneath the bark. Uh, it's like a beautiful pale yellow. Um, there are two different kinds of birch trees that we have around here. We have the white birch and we have the yellow birch. I personally prefer the yellow birch because it has a really nice spearminty flavor. Um, and you can eat it raw, so just like this. Or you can do what I've done, which is dry it again. And you turn it into flour, which is how I learnt with my studies for um, living history and studying the people who um, created food to last throughout the winter, such as the Mohawk, um, such as the Cree, um, that they used it like this to survive through winter months when food was scarce. So yes, Adirondacks are, means uh, the bark eater, and you can in fact eat the bark. So um, that for, for me is the most important thing on this entire table. But there are things like um, June berries, which you'll see over here. June berries or Saskatchewan berries as they're called uh, come out in the month of June. You can dry them. They taste like cherries. They're absolutely wonderful. So I dehydrate them. But when you hydrate them, again, this is like an hour and a half ago, they turn into lovely, big, fat, plump berries that you can do wonderful jams and pies with. Um, and they grow really easily here. So if you do have a garden, I, I totally suggest you also grow them at home. Rose hips again, another thing, very high in vitamin C. And uh, if you've watched the Alone Show or any of the Alone Show spin-offs, you'll know that a lot of the ladies there did eat rose hips um, because of the vitamin C content. Um, grasses such as sedges. Uh, curly dock is another amazing plant which grows prolifically in the Adirondacks. As you can see, it's here. And the seeds were often um, captured and uh, again ground down into flour, which is beautiful. And this was used to make a darker kind of bread um, or patty. Uh, there's also an, another lichen called the willer lichen, which is further down south. And that was also used to make a darker, blacker bread. Um, very delicious flavor, very cool. Um, this is a very interesting thing. I would like to show you these. I'm not sure if you recognize them immediately, but they are milkweed and um, milkweed is also edible. Not only is it good for your butterflies, but the stems here, if you boil them um, for 20 minutes, um, I always boil my greens twice because of the um, acids, but if you boil them 20 minutes, again, it's edible. So um, milkweed is a yummy, yummy thing, um, as is nettles and lamb's quarters. Um, all of which 
Yeah, everything here is very much prevalent in the woods and mountains and uh, lowlands of the Adirondacks and Vermont. Um, burdock was another one. Um, I, I have only just learnt about burdock and I find it very interesting. It was through my living history classes that I teach. Um, the first, the burdock was introduced uh, into the, what is now called America, in the 1600s um, by the English and the French. Um, the root, the first year root, is what you eat. So it's a horrible plant with its uh, sticky seed pods that get everywhere and itch your skin. But you can actually get your revenge on it by eating the roots. So um, I totally recommend it. Um, and what they used to do was dry it again and turn it into flour. It's a very common theme uh, with a lot of um, lichens and bulbs and uh, mushrooms even. You turn things into flour so that you have them for winter months um, so that you can um, survive basically and flourish. Lots of carbs and starches, really yummy. This um, for me is really important because um, I found it quite a lot um, out in the Arctic and I also find it right back at home. Uh, the styles of this are different, slightly different, it's smaller but it's the same plant and it's called the rock tripe. Um, historically, this was used um, as early as the 1600s and was recorded in 1777 in the Battle at Valley Forge um, by Washington for his troops who were shown this by the Stockbridge Mohicans um, to survive on uh, during the winter months when their supplies ran out. It's incredibly important and a lot of uh, soldiers there managed to uh, kind of live through the winter because of it. Uh, rock tripe is an incredible thing. When it's moist, it's, it's very um, flexible, but then dries up to a very lightweight, portable food source, which is great in carbs and uh, starches and gives you energy. And not only that, it tastes really good too. So that's always a win-win when you're looking at uh, food sources to forage and survive on and give you energy for whatever it is that you're doing. So, rock tripe. That's probably something that a lot of people haven't thought about, like what the food that was like sustaining some of the soldiers yeah. that were like, you know, responsible for the founding of, of the nation. Absolutely. I mean, th that's why I'm a historical forager, because so many of the things, the foods were forgotten or have been forgotten. And, and I love to reintroduce them, so to speak, into people's um, minds and imaginations and also diets as well. You know, people walk past rock tripe all the time when they're in the, on hikes and they look at it and they have a, a wonder, but they don't quite know what to do with it. And all you need to do is to peel it off a wall, take off the dark brown bits and um, boil it in water, which is exactly what I did in the Arctic. And I have to say, I enjoyed it very much. <laughs> Tell me when you're rolling. I'm rolling. And can you like sort of put your hand on yep. it a little bit like you were doing before? Yep. And this will just be for cutaways sure. basically. So this one especially I want to tell you is a smaller leafed version and I have um, back at the um, homestead um, the larger one uh, which is even more delicious to eat I have mm -hmm. to say. But yes there are many many different varieties of rock tripe um, but they're all each equally as nutritious uh, easy to carry, very lightweight, and it doesn't matter if they get crumbled into flour because that's essentially what you're going to do with them anyway. Um, can you talk a little bit in general just about like why you love foraging? Like it's, you know, it's not like a very common hobby, I think. I'm, I, I actually, I, I actually don't know how common a, ho a hobby it is, but like just, you know, explain your interest in it. If, if yeah, for sure. Don't mind. Why do I love foraging? Um, I love foraging because I have seen more and more that fruits and vegetables and meats are being cross-pollinated, cross-bred, um, and they have lost their sense of nature, so to speak. So when I go out into the woods, what I like to do is I like to learn a different plant every time I go out. I like to teach people about the plants and, and how you can use them and how you can eat them. It's good for you. It's healthy. and Nature is made for that reason. It can heal you, it can feed you, sometimes it can kill you, but <laughs> most of the times it heals, it heals you and feeds you. And um, it's a low cost way of 
essentially just getting out into the, the woods and um, just enjoying what there is out here, which is amazing. I think we should be out more and more. It's, it's, it's a very good thing, especially since COVID. You know, COVID uh, made us all realize that uh, being out in the woods was a, a healing and healthy way of exercising. And I can't say enough good things about it. So I find that when I walk out into the woods that you feel a connection with nature. Um, so often when I have to go into the cities, uh, all you, you can't even see the sky because the buildings are so tall. And I, I find that walking in the wood allows me to recenter myself and ground myself uh, and, and feel more at home. In some respects, we have lost that with all of our technology and uh, foraging and walking in the woods helps me get back to the simple simpleness of life which is so important to feel good about yourself, I think. Uh, just leave technology behind and just immerse yourself in this wonderful thing that we have that is, is all around us, especially here in the Adirondacks. And if you were to, uh, if someone were to come to you and be like, I'm interested in foraging, but I have no idea where to start, like what would be a good like beginner mission or yeah, yeah. Uh, thing to send them on? If someone was interested in foraging and uh, came to me and asked how they could start to learn those kind of things, uh, depending on where they were based, um, I would say uh, find a, a guided walk. Uh, I know in some of the cities that they will do walks in, uh, in and around the parks there. Um, I would also turn yourself to YouTube. Um, there are some incredible uh, YouTubers um, and then also people like Nicole Appellian, for example, who is a pastor loner. Uh, she has a, a great series of books. Um, and I would, I would recommend that. When it comes to mushrooms, if you're interested in mycology, which is one of my greatest passions, I would say um, do it carefully and slowly. Um, if you're a part of Facebook, um, there are many Facebook uh, mushroom identification pages and uh, most definitely do not eat anything unless you are 100% sure of what it is that you have in front of you and those pages will help you. There are also really good books and um, I'll show you an array of them to help you identify what it is you have in front of you. Um, is, there a, is there an overarching philosophy about foraging? I know that's a very open-ended question. Um, but yeah. I like to ask those kinds of questions. Yeah, no, no, I, I want you to ask as many questions as you can. I think that maybe even as early as five years ago, foraging was considered a kind of obscure hippie-esque thing that not too many people did. And the, the more that we are questioning things in our lives and COVID most definitely made us question things in our lives. The more people are realizing that foraging gives you the opportunity to source your food in a clean and healthy environment that hasn't been um, kind of manipulated in any way, shape or form. It's free, it's healthy, it's clean, and also it can heal you, feed you and heal you. And all those things are really important for um, a good and healthy life. And um, can you talk a little bit about um, how foraging led to you being on the Alone series? Sure, sure. So I have been foraging. Um, originally, it was mushrooms, teaching people on Instagram about what kind of mushrooms there were in the northeast um, of America. And uh, then it goes, it, it carried on to plants. <laughs> and then it was just basically being outdoors and enjoying and, and this gradu gradual kind of cycle um, appeared to attract the attention of uh, one of the casting directors for uh, the Alone show. Uh, my knowledge for historical foraging and how it tied in with living history as a really interesting facet um, as being a possible part participant on the show. So I think when they asked me for, to try out for season 10 for the Alone Show for History Channel, then I accepted because living history is an incredible thing. You know, to tell history, to show history is awesome. 
and uh, I really wanted to educate and introduce people to new foods that are native to this land and also that were introduced by the English and the French and the Spanish as they um, came into what we now call the America. We were in Saskatchewan, uh, but we were basically in the Arctic. It's the Arctic Circle. Okay. So, so it, uh, I can give you a, a very easy answer about what did I learn whilst I was out there. And I think it's a common thread, which I find um, from so many past Alone Show contestants when we talk, is that you basically learn that you don't need technology as much as you think you do and uh, you learn to slow down, you learn to stop multitasking, and you learn to just breathe and relax in the moment and be present, which is uh, something that so often we forget to do. Um, what is... Um What's your mindset in the wilderness? I mean, you talked about sort of like being present in, in, the, in, in, in the moment. Um, what does that mean though? Are you focusing on, okay, where's my next meal gonna come from? Oh, you mean um, when I'm in the Arctic or yes. in general? Um, take, take it however you... Okay, you when, you, like. when you ask me what my mindset is um, when I'm in the wilderness, obviously there's two kinds of wilderness. Um, one is the amazing Adirondack State Park, which I'm in quite often and I absolutely love. And, and when I'm here, um, I'm enjoying the beauty um, of this incredible six million acre park. Um, and also I'm foraging. My eyes, once you know what's food and, and what isn't, your eyes are always scanning. You're always foraging for food, even if you're not picking it up. Um, but when I was in the Arctic, I think, it, Again, it was food, but it's storing, making sure that you have supplies. And uh, my historical foraging really came into play then and uh, really did me well. I think when you're in a situation where you do only have 10 items, um, what you're looking for is to create supplies for the future. So I spend a lot of my time uh, foraging, um, carbs and starches of all different kinds and you're going to have to watch the show to find out what they were. <laughs> what, uh, what motivates you to take on such, a, such an endeavor like that? Like it's got to be, um, like, e like even if you only lasted like a couple of days, I have to imagine even that was like fairly satisfying. What motivated me to accept the challenge for going on History Channel's Alone show? Um, I am a huge, huge proponent of Carpe Diem, like massive. If I can learn something new every day, I'll do it. If I can push myself and challenge myself, then I will, because I have seen um, many people um, suffer from terminal illnesses, uh, my own mother included, and uh, she especially encouraged me to seize every moment you can and uh, embrace embrace the unknown and uh, have an amazing experience whilst doing it, which is, I think it's a good mantra. Yeah, it is. Um, sorry, the other question I started to ask is like, um, you seem to know all, a lot about like the local history. Can you talk about like, just sort of like your love of the, like the local history and how it maybe it is tied to the land and sort of the natural, the natural ecosystem? Yeah. Uh, when I moved up to the Adirondack State Park, I had no real knowledge of what had passed here before me. Uh, and it was through um, falling in love with my partner, Brian. Um, and he's a mixed blood Mohawk. Um, and he also reenacts in living history. It was that I realized just the, the huge amount of things that have happened here and I just fell in love with the area. I fell in love with what there is around here, the people that aren't necessarily talked about quite so much, but, um, and women included, because we weren't really talked about so much either. But if you delve deep into the um, journals and uh, kind of uh, diaries of um, a lot of the uh, traders, the fur traders, the Indian agents, you begin to learn what happened here. And um, I have definitely learned so much in my four years of uh, 
of being and uh, living in this amazing wilderness. I might not have answered that question correctly. Do you want to rephrase it and I'll answer it again? Um, no, I mean, I thought... I that thought was okay? That, yeah, okay, cool. If I'm not giving you what you need, rephrase and oh, ask me fair. again, okay? Um, what happens to a person when they separate themselves from civilization, do you think, from your first-hand experience? My first-hand experience of what happens every time I separate myself from civilization is that... I put my phone down <laughs> and our phone is pretty much uh, the kind of like the attachment to our hip or to our back pocket or to our backpack and uh, once you put your phone down you really start relaxing into the, the tempo of nature which is well you've heard the saying country time that's what it is it's not so fast-paced it's uh, relaxed and there are times of day when the fish bites. There are times of day when the raven flies over or the osprey flies over, which he's doing right now. Um, there are times of day when, you know, it's just the dew falls on the grass. There's smells that you begin to notice. You become much more connected to nature. And I think it's one of the best forms of therapy you can get. Um. I'm going to challenge you a little bit to sort of expand on that. Sure. Um, and I'm, I'm getting very, like, I don't know, not sort of philosophical, but like, um, it seems like the course of like human history has been like moving towards like civilizing the land more and <laughs> more. And I think that. Um, I don't think I, we're civilizing the land. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> um, you know what? Actually, I'll. I'll Sorry, can, can you give me that again? And I'll just let you expand on it because yeah. most people would consider it, uh, you know, maybe not civilizing the land, but like moving towards civilization, moving towards like- In technology, in yeah, respect like, to like technology. Yeah, man-made things. Yeah. Like we seem to be like moving in a more like, just moving towards tech technology. And so there, it, it seems like it's a very intentional choice to like swim against that tide. It's definitely an intentional choice to swim against the tide of becoming more and more dependent on technology. You know, my life choice right now is that I live with Brian on top of a mountain, completely off grid. I have solar, um, I have a well for water and I feel so much better for it. I mean, I know that life becomes easier when you have technology, for sure, don't get me wrong. And we, and we do need it, but this rising uh, consensus that we we can't survive without technology is simply not true it really isn't you have to learn and a lot of people do once they get older once they've you know fit, their families have grown for example um, that 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 is the point of life it, this this is the point of life you know money doesn't um, delete that about money can't talk about that this is the point of life. Uh, this has been here way before we were and will continue to be here. The sun will rise and the sun will set. And that is the, the most, philosophically, I guess, the, the most constant thing we have. Technology just is a form of distraction to the beauty of what we have around us. And um, it makes me happy whenever I see people put their technology away and start to learn and absorb this incredible thing that we have here. Well, you have to excuse me while I get my technology out. And make sure <laughs> I've, I've I have a pad and system. paper, look! <laughs> <laughs> See, that's the thing, for um, us as historical reenactors, we believe people were more alive back then than they are now. We mm -hmm. the civilized nations. Mm -hmm. For sure, yeah. yeah. Um, you maybe already answered this um but i will ask it just in case you give me sure. like a better answer like what do you see as the benefit of like stepping away from civilization and coming out and seeing the natural beauty we have behind you so when you ask me what i see is the benefit from stepping away from civilization and coming out here into this gorgeous natural beauty i would say it allows me the 
chance to breathe, to reflect, to think, and uh, to sort my thoughts out. Um, more and more, I'm going to tell you, um, this is a form of actual therapy. Uh, there are guided walks and uh, therapists actually take their patients out into nature. Um, and some of them make them take their shoes off too, uh, to ground themselves, uh, uh, because they find that it slows the heartbeat down, reduces stress, and uh, helps and benefit the uh, human soul. So I'm just doing it as much as I can, whenever I can, um, as my own form of therapy and uh, lifestyle. It's, it's a wonderful one to have. Do it. I think there are a couple of things I, I would like to add, and it is, um, yeah, definitely get outside if you can. And and, and try and learn something about this nature that we are surrounded in. Even in the cities, there are city parks and there are people that do guided tours um, that, that can teach you a few bits and pieces. Um, learn your history is really important. Uh, having uh, had two children myself, I know what is taught in school and what actually um, happened in history are sometimes two very different things. So that's a very important thing. And um, Never eat anything that you don't 100% know what it is. That's very important, um, especially if it's a mushroom. Uh, those are three very important things.